been told it's unlikely that any changes will happen before 2025. That's 13 years after the first proposals were put forward. I mean, that's a very long time in politics. But it's a very long time in the NHS as well. And so what I'm looking for for government is something uh, more of substance because we've had virtually nothing in terms of writing, in terms of consultation, in terms of engagement with the public since those uh, announcements back in, in 2013. There, what has grown up in the, uh, in the, in the um, vacuum that's been created by the, the health service since simply not engaging is uh, a substantial expertise in the community through, the, say, the hospitals movement, through the trade unions, and indeed through local people generally. Um, an independent survey, conducted independently by polling organisations, uh, recently showed that 90% of people in the West London area oppose these proposals. 90%. Um, and that's borne out in, in every other possible survey that I've seen. And that 82% think they haven't been involved in the decisions properly. And I urge the, the Minister to, to listen to those and to turn over a page in terms of uh, engaging with the community uh, in relation uh, in relation to, the, to those matters. Um, I go back to the point which my old friend for uh, in Central Action has raised. Uh, last month, the four-hour waiting time was only achieved in 70% of cases for the two um, uh, uh, hospitals in, in, in Imperial. They're not disaggregated, so I can't give you exact figures for Charing Cross, I'm afraid. But St Mary's and Charing Cross combined, 70% seem within. And that has been a regular pattern. Over, over months and years previously, and in particular since the closure of the A&E departments at Central Middlesex and, and Hammersmith Hospital. Um, the population is growing uh, hugely. The, the health demands, not just because of an ageing population, but because of a very mobile and very diverse population in the area have been growing. And these are not, on the whole, people who do not need acute care. Indeed, it's been the case, it's been good practice at Charing Cross for many years that if you arrive at that hospital and you have something that can be dealt with by a nurse or a GP or in some way, or, or an urgent care centre, some way other than needing consult care, you are simply filtered off because all those services are available on site. Uh, this isn't uh, the, the case of unsuitable use. This is a case of growing demand and a lack of resources to deal with that demand. And that's why I do urge the uh, Minister, and I'm going to now in a moment, I want to give the Minister a, a, a proper opportunity uh, to respond, to, to not uh, read out the brief again, because I've heard it with, with respect a, a number of times over the last uh, five years. Uh, I genuinely wish to engage in trying to reassess what's happened. So um, I welcome in the debate in the, in, the, in the other place on the 18th of October, which was uh, called by my, uh, uh, my, my uh, friend Lord Dubbs, who's a Hammersmith uh, resident, and who, uh, well, the only one that I could, led a debate which a number of, uh, of peers took place in, specifically, again, on the issue of Charing Cross. And the minister there responded by saying... Um, there will be no reduction in A and E or acute capacity at Charing Cross hospitals unless and until a reduction in acute demand can be achieved. Now, those are very welcome words to have put on the record, um, and I'm sure the Minister will, will not be uh, resigning from that today. But what I would ask is that there is therefore an assessment of whether that is likely to happen and whether that is likely to happen in the foreseeable future. Because if it's not going to happen for another uh, four years or eight years or 12 years or however long, I've, just, I've simply put it to the Minister that he cannot, they cannot persist with simply saying, we will do this when the time is right. It creates uncertainty, it creates demoralisation among staff, it, it, it gives a, a motivation for management not to maintain and keep services up because they're effectively throwing good money into a building they believe will not be there within the foreseeable future. So that's my first request to the Minister, that we do have a proper assessment of whether actually that shaping a healthy future proposals are still fit for purpose, um, as the government believed, even though I didn't, in 2012. And the second point, which the, which the Minister made, is that none of the land on the hospital site has been designated as surplus land for redevelopment. Now, I would
approached the ministers to say what exactly is meant by that. We were told in terms in 2012 and 2013 that that land that would not be used for health service purposes would be disposed of privately in order to subsidise the cost of the building on the land that would remain within the health service. So are, is that supposed to mean that that is now not going to happen or is it simply that no formal proposals have been brought, brought forward? This, as I said, has been a hospital site for well over a century. It's a hospital that's existed for two centuries and it would be a, a, a great pity if on my watch and the ministers that no longer became to be the case, particularly at a time when it is most needed by those in, in my constituency and others uh, who, who have used it throughout their and their families' lives. The question is that this House has considered the future of Charing Cross Hospital. Philip Dunn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rossendale. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon and a pleasure to have been left a sufficient time, hopefully, to be able to uh, address some of the concerns raised by the Honourable Member for Hammersmith and Fulham, who uh, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for engaging with my office in advance to indicate uh, the line of questioning he was going to take in this debate. Uh, and I think he's, he's uh, made his points with characteristic uh, skill. And, uh, and calm composure, which is much appreciated. Um, I'm going to set the uh, issue of Charing Cross within the context of the wider STP for North West London, which he referred to uh, briefly in his remarks, um, because uh, that is how the NHS is now looking at the future of healthcare provision for populations across the country. And Charing Cross within the Imperial uh, uh, Trust sits firmly within the North West London uh, Sustainability and Transformation Partnership, the footprint for which uh, has funding of some £3.7 billion um, and at present and between 2015 and 16 and 2020-21 this is expected uh, to rise by over £600 million, an increase of some 17%. Uh, and I would say to him, as he is uh, aware is the government's position that any potential service change affecting Charing Cross is a matter, matter for the local NHS. It will be determined primarily through the prism of the STP and the uh, leadership uh, uh, for, uh, for that uh, wider NHS uh, group. And in our view, it is right that decisions for service configuration are led by local clinicians who understand uh, uh, better than uh, uh, the, the, the national NHS the healthcare needs of their local population and that they do so in consultation with local people, which is one of his, uh, his challenges to the process. All proposed service changes uh, will be based on clear evidence that they deliver better outcomes for patients. Wait, I wonder if he was familiar with the King's Fund analysis of the STPs from February of this year, 2017, which concluded that despite all the warm wor words about the new models of care, they're actually driven by financial imperatives more than clinician-driven. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that. And of course, the, uh, the analysis that was done at that time was into the preliminary drafts of the STPs before they'd had any uh, assessment by uh, NHS England uh, or indeed by the Department of Health. So these are evolving uh, plans and becoming partnerships uh, and will take, we'll, they will move at differing speeds in different parts of the country depending on the, uh, the quality of the work that has been done uh, and the extent to which they meet uh, the four tests for service change, which I was going on to, which are that they should have support from GP commissioners, they should be based on clinical evidence, they should demonstrate public and patient engagement and they should consider patient choice. In addition to those, NHS England introduced a new test from the 1st of April this year on the future use of beds, which I think is pertinent to the Charing Cross case, uh, which requires commissioners to assure NHS England that, the, that any proposed reduction in acute hospital beds is sustainable over the longer term and that key risks such as staffing levels have been addressed. The, uh, pl the plan for North West London, the STP, was published in uh, November 2016, and it confirmed at the time 
that the Shaping a Healthier Future programme, which the Honourable Gentleman quite rightly referred to, published in 2012, had set out the right plans to reshape health services across northwest London to respond to rapidly changing health and care needs. So the uh, Shaping a Healthy Health Future plan does form a, a, a core part within the STP plan. It is my understanding the STP leadership intend to take that forward. There was a full public consultation in 2012 on these plans for a more integrated approach to care whereby specialist services would be consolidated on fewer sites in North, across North West London to improve quality and efficiency and routine and chronic care would be expanded to improve access, particularly uh, in the community. It was proposed that Charing Cross would become a growing hub for integrated care within this network of services. And following feedback from the public consultation, the proposals were refined to retain a wider range of services than was initially proposed on the Charing Cross site. In October uh, the following year, 2013, the Secretary of State for Health clearly set out, following the full public consultation, that both Charing Cross and Ealing Hospitals would retain A&E services, even if in a different shape and size from current arrangements, and this remains uh, the proposal today. But no final decisions have been made about the exact nature of services that are planned to continue at Charing Cross Hospital. What is certain is that even if changes are made, there will still be a thriving Charing Cross Hospital. There will be uh, an engagement with the public in due course on the detailed design and implementation of services on the site, which will include cancer, outpatients, diagnostics and 24-7 local A&E services. The STP is initially... I'll just, just, just finish this point, if I may. Uh, the STP is initially focusing, as the Honourable Gentleman quite rightly said in his remarks, on developing new models of care to reduce demand on acute services. And I, I'm grateful to him for welcoming uh, the improvement of services in the community so that it can then be uh, established that those are working before uh, acute configuration, reconfiguration uh, takes place um, uh, through this proposal. I'll give way to the uh, I'm grateful to the Minister again for giving way. He's been very generous. Um, he pointed out that no final decisions have been taken, but it, can you not appreciate that that, is, um, that uncertainty creates a lack of morale for the staff there? I had to visit Charing Cross very regularly for my late mother, who we lost during the election campaign. Her specialist, Dr Perry, was there. And there just seems to be a sapping of morale from the staff there. It's demoralising because they don't know what's going on. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about the honourable lady's uh, uh, mother. Uh, she has my considerable sympathy um, and condolences. I'm going to come on to the issue of staff morale, and I think she's quite right to raise it. And it is important that we, uh, in, where, whichever side we're on in this debate, do what we can to ensure that the staff of uh, all our NHS facilities, particularly in this case Charing Cross Hospital, have confidence and clarity that they have a, 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 you know, a good career prospects working in that hospital and whatever we, however we describe the challenges in our local NHS, we shouldn't try to undermine um, the, the importance of those facilities to our local residents and therefore the importance of encouraging staff to continue to work there. I'm, I'm most uh, grateful for being very uh, generous. What I said, I think, is that, that I applaud the aims of improving the community services my CCG is facing £17 million pounds of, of further saving. That puts great difficulty in maintaining services, let alone improving them. And Imperial Trust ha has a huge deficit. And uh, as far as I can see, most of the sustainability transformation funds for the, the current year or the year just gone have gone into addressing those deficits. That's the difficulty with putting it forward. That's why I asked for a review of where we're going, because these are hopes which aren't being fulfilled. Well, I think it, it, is, uh, it is fair to say that part of the, the, S, the, the objective of the STP is to, uh, to help the NHS uh, within a particular area work more cooperatively together to encourage uh, better so public health for the population as a whole and thereby uh, work within the, budget, the available budgets that have been uh, give, allocated to them by NHS England uh, and creating a coherent plan for the entire area uh, we, we think is the most logical way uh, to try and ensure that that happens. Um, 
as I have stated, Mr. Rossendale, the service change is a matter for the local NHS, and the local NHS have been clear that there will be no changes at Charing Cross before 2021, as was acknowledged by the Honourable Gentleman. In the meantime, uh, as the Honourable Member did not reference, NHS England have confirmed their commitment to Charing Cross Hospital and invested £8 million in the hospital in the last year alone. This funding enabled refurbishment of urgent and emergency care wards, theatres, outpatient clinic and lifts, as well as the creation of a patient services centre, service centre and the main new facility for North West London pathology. Further significant investments are also planned, notwithstanding what the Honourable Gentleman says about the uh, current financial situation of the Imperial Trust. It remains the case that the SGP is planning in due course a phased new build across North West London, including on the Charing Cross site, rather than refurbishing existing buildings. But the STP is not yet at the point of finalising that plan. And I can confirm, as he asked me to do, that no hospital run by Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, including Charing Cross, has declared any site at surplus land. He asked whether that, what commitment that means for the future, and clearly until the plans are completely finalised, it, uh, it would be wrong of me to, uh, to, to give any further indication on what that might mean in relation to land, because it will depend on the configuration of the buildings uh, that uh, have yet to be, to be designed. So it's, uh, it would be an, an unrealistic expectation to be definitive about that uh, today. To, to go back to the point made by the uh, Honourable Member for Ealing Central and Acton about workforce, as I say, I'm glad she's raised it. Um, it is unsurprising that discussions about proposed service change has created some uncertainty for staff, patients and uh, other stakeholders, including local residents. But there has been a very clear position on the future development of Charing Cross since the uh, STP plan for North West London was published a year ago. And this position has been shared widely with staff and all stakeholders. And I, as I said earlier, I sincerely hope that, um, that my remarks today uh, can help to reassure uh, staff working within the hospital that there are, will be no changes uh, uh, to, for, to service levels for until, until the very earliest 2021, and that the uh, local NHS's commitment to Charing Cross Hospital uh, uh, has been reaffirmed. In August of this year, the Trust leadership undertook a review to understand more fully the issue of staff morale at Charing Cross and to develop any actions in response uh, to that uh, review. The conclusion was that site-level data does not indicate that Charing Cross is affected by poor morale or has more difficulty than any other sites within the Trust in recruiting and retaining staff. There are, however, higher vacancy levels among a few specific staff groups in certain areas, uh, such as elderly care. So in response to that review, the Trust leadership team have established an action plan, including organising uh, a succession of staff briefings, and the Trust earlier this week announced a public meeting for local residents on the 27th of September, uh, November, excuse me, November, to ensure clarity on the future position of Charing Cross, and as well as in sharing information about recent and planned investments on the site. And I would strongly encourage uh, the Honourable Gentleman to attend that meeting, if he's able to, uh, to help uh, provide his, uh, uh, or to understand what the Trust is saying, and to provide reassurance to local residents uh, of the state of the hospital. The Trust has been in correspondence with the leader of Hammersmith and Fulham Council um, over, regarding mailings that they have been sending to residents which do not reflect uh, the evolving position at Charing Cross. As well as raising constituents' concerns, we should also have, we have a responsibility to allay fears uh, when discussing this, as I've said earlier, and we can best do that by being clear about what it is and what is not in prospect and by encouraging them to take up the offers of engagement made by local decision makers, which I understand the Council has expressed some concern about doing. The Government remains committed to supporting the local NHS to engage well with its local population and local conditions to ensure that decisions about services in North West London are made in the best interests of patients now and in the future. And I hope that the Honourable Member's constituents, uh, who are paying attention to this debate, 
uh, will make the most of the opportunities to participate in future public engagement on the design of services in their area, and as many as possible will attend the meeting on the 27th of November at the hospital. Thank you, Mr. President. The question is that this House has considered the future of Charing Cross Hospital. As many as other opinions say, aye. To the contrary, no. Order, order. We now move on to the next debate.